Well, welcome to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Good. Our guest for this episode is Dr. Britt Andriata, who is an internationally recognized thought leader and creates science-based solutions for today's challenges. She's also the CEO of Brain Aware Training and the former Chief Learning Officer for Lynda.com, which is now LinkedIn Learning. She has published several best-selling titles, including Wired to Resist, The Brain Science of Why Change Fails, and A New Model for Driving Success, which is going to be the topic of today's episode. This episode explores the reasons behind the failures of many change initiatives, the factors that influence the success of change outcomes. We're going to talk about the change curve and what happens in our brains during change. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast, where we engage with esteemed thought leaders and explore research-backed strategies and techniques that empower leaders at every level to achieve meaningful results that drive lasting change. I was amazed to realize that failed change initiatives affect every industry, every level of the organization. They occur from every functional capacity as well, from marketing to human resources to production to legal. And it is estimated that 50 to 75% of change initiatives fail. That's just just mind-boggling to me. What do you think is the major cause of that? Or is there just one cause? Yeah, I mean, I I, had seen that research from Harvard who found that number. And when you start to dig in, you know, it really is because most change is rolled out in a way that goes against human biology. So it's just that we're kind of setting up our work environments in a way that isn't really aligned with how humans work or respond to change. There's also kind of three types of failure that can happen. One is failure to launch, which means there's just too much resistance to get the plan change off the ground. So that really, you know, if leaders have done a, a, you know, they may have a great change, but if they didn't get their their travelers. We call them travelers because sometimes it's employees, sometimes it might be your customers. But if you don't do the work to get them ready for the change, they can just stall it out on you. Um, The second type of failure is failure to sustain. So your good idea gets launched, but it never gets that sufficient adoption to become part of the day-to-day work or culture of the organization. And then the third type is, so you did that right, but it's called failure to scale and the change cannot transition successfully as the organization grows. So it somehow, it outgrows its, its lifespan within the organization as it gets bigger. So out of those three forms of failure, which one do you think is the most common? Well, you know, when you think about change, senior executives spend a lot of time deciding that change is needed, designing it. It's not like it's just whipped together, you know, uh, willy nilly. Usually it's really a well thought out plan, but that's the problem. The focus is always put on the structural change itself. I've gone in and seen 10 binders for the change initiative, but what's not paid attention to is the human reaction to that change, what's also called the transition. And so a lot of change initiatives launch without support, almost a quarter of them do. Um, so the teams that are expected to change are not given the information or the resources they need to actually be successful. Or the other thing that I see happen is, is in those early stages, again, is that leaders were not anticipating resistance. And so they start to get really uncomfortable with it. And they either pull the change or they try to force people too fast. And of course, that gets even more resistance. So it's really in not thinking about the human part. And that usually happens once you are announcing the change and kind of starting it. I've seen that as well. The fair, failure to launch is, is quite common from my personal and professional experience. The sustaining and the scaling of it, not so much, but still I see that as well. You mentioned that there's essentially five types of change for organizations. It's There's strategic change, structural change, process change, talent change, and cultural change. Which of those changes is the most difficult, would you say? You know, each of them can be. They All of them can be made better or worse, depending on if people are mindful of how people respond to change. But I think the the ones that can be the hardest to move the needle on is cultural, just because typically once you identify that you need a culture shift, it usually means something has happened and the culture isn't the way you want it to be. And so you may now may have a whole lot of behaviors and attitudes and beliefs that are kind of baked in. And you can even change out everyone on the team and yet it will still go to this dysfunction. 
And that's because if we allow dysfunction to stay in place too long, humans move into a psychological state called learned helplessness, which is when they give up trying and they don't believe that they can try anymore. And really, if you don't have psychological safety, you can't even embark on a cultural change because people need to be able to take risks and make mistakes and, and be honest. So I think cultural is the stickiest and hardest to make happen, usually because the things that are problematic are already really need like focused attention in order to make the shift happen. Well, that makes sense um, as well. We're going to touch upon that as part of the leader's toolkit in navigating successful change. Now I'd like to move into the change curve, and the most famous change curve is by Kubler-Ross, her model. It identifies certain parts of the change process that perhaps you can unpack for us, and then love to give our listeners kind of a revised, a change quest model that you've developed that really speaks more to certain areas that that original change curve didn't really focus on or might have even left out. Yeah, so what's really interesting is Kubler-Ross's research was originally about stages of grief and how people move through grief. And so she envisioned it as kind of going down into a valley and coming back up, and that there's predictable emotions that people have, resistance and denial, and then anger and frustration, and then depression, and then eventually getting on board with it. And no one would have thought that this had an application to change, except a hospital was doing a training for all of their employees on Kubler-Ross's death and dying model, and they realized that they had gone through all the same stages with a recent change that happened in the hospital. And so that launched into a whole lot of studies that happened on the business side of things. And it became really clear that her model, and it got renamed to the change curve as it was applied to business, really described how people respond to change. I took that same model, but I flipped it visually upside down. So you're going over a mountain because what I have found and, and then a lot of the brain science research uh, really reinforces is that the heavy lift is at the beginning. It's when change is first announced, our biology is wired to um, assume the worst, consider the potential dangers and losses, look for all the things that might go wrong. That's just part of our biology, our survival biology. And so all of kind of the difficult feelings, the frustration, the grumbling happens at the early stages. And then we get over the hump. And I, I call it the peak of resignation because there's three things that can happen there. One is people resign. They quit. Forget it. I'm out of here. I don't want to do this. The second one is that it usually employees go, okay, I better resign myself to get on board because it looks like this is happening. And so people just kind of lean into it. But the third type is that leaders who are not expecting any of this grumbling or upset start to panic. And sometimes they pull the change and they say, never mind, when really they just needed patience for this biological process because we do get over the hump. And that's when we start to look toward the future. We can start to see potential gains or benefits from the change. And then we can start to feel excited and interested and maybe still a little healthy skepticism thrown in. But eventually we get the momentum going and we, and we can succeed with change. So that's the change curve in the model. Um, the change quest is just flipping it upside down and, and starting to really apply it to how we can roll out change in organizations. But I like how you changed it so that it's an uphill climb because that's what change feels like physically and emotionally, that there's some level of exertion that has to be done. It's, it's also designed, your model is, to be interactive, allowing you to adjust the axes to gain a clearer picture of how the change is going to be perceived um, and experienced by employees. And it can be really mapped onto those four distinct types of change journeys that you feel represent a lot of the change that we encounter in the workplace, and they are the long and intense climb. The second journey is the quick hike, hike up a steep hill. Third is the long, steady trek. And then the fourth is the pebble on the trail. Perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that long, intense climb and how that kind of maps out. Yeah, great question. So yeah, I wanted the accesses dialable because no one change is equal to another change. So this kind of gives us some ways of categorizing change. So when the vertical axis is disruption, how disruptive that change will be, and it also is a measure of resistance because the more disruptive, the more resistance you're going to get. And then along the horizontal axis is time or time to acclimation, right? How long it'll take people to get used to this change. So then the long, intense climb is highly disruptive. It's going to take a long time to get used to. 
An example might be a merger or acquisition, right? Like it might get announced, but really it takes a long time for that integration to happen. Um, and when we when it's announced, I mean, your reaction is just like, oh no, like that looks hard. That looks like it's going to take a long time and, and be a lot of effort. And so people come to it a little overwhelmed. And so it really can play out. And what it means is the leaders, which honestly are the frontline managers, executives may decide change is needed, but really it's your frontline managers who are taking their individual employees or their teams through it. They're the ones that have to sell the change and keep people motivated and ad address the problems that show up because nothing ever unfolds as it's supposed to. And oftentimes we don't give that group of people, the middle managers, the training they need to really manage all that stuff. So the long and intense climb is one. The quick hike up a steep hill is something like maybe changing software. While the, the switch gets flipped overnight, it oftentimes still requires a lot of effort. And so people can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's a, it's a sprint. Um, and so they know they're going to have to do some heavy lifting to get up and over that one. And that one also can cause a lot of stress for people, particularly if you don't build in some recovery time, you just hit them with another one on the backside of it. Because many people are going through multiple change journeys at the same time. And we talk about change journeys, not just in the workplace, but at home as well on a personal level. Perhaps you've moved, gone through a relationship change. All of that stuff impacts that change fatigue that you have and how in your ability to deal with change, right? Absolutely. In fact, this was the catalyst for me writing the book. I had just written the first book, which was Wired to Grow, all about the brain science of learning. And that was the only book I intended to write. And then LinkedIn acquired lynda.com. And I was in the middle of this change experience and I was certified in all the change management models. I was leading change training on other people's research. And I realized none of it was working. It was not helping in the middle of this change that I was excited about. I wasn't even like upset. I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity. And so when I started researching change and why we're so resistant, it really just comes down to this, this thing that our biology has it has to go through some some aspects of this right and so why it was also difficult for me is that in addition to this huge announcement i was already in the middle of a kitchen remodel so we were barbecuing every meal and i was doing dishes in the bathtub and my mom was having a health situation and i was needing to move her to assisted living and so my bandwidth for change was already maxed out and that's the thing is like, I, I know people like to say, oh, your personal life is personal and your work life is, is separate. They're not separate because we only have one body. <laughs> and so whatever is going on in the totality of your life all contributes to how maxed out your bandwidth is, how, how resilient you feel at any one point in time. And this is why leaders need to pay attention to how much change you're rolling out at any one time. You can push people into change fatigue and burnout. Well, how does change fatigue and burnout really differ? Because they both are similar and change fatigue is definitely real. But if you could just kind of distinguish between those two and maybe give us some tips for both. Yeah, let me flesh them out a little bit. So change fatigue is when change is coming at you so fast and furious that you don't have a chance to kind of settle into the new normal before all of a sudden you're hit with change again. Before the pandemic, 47% of executives felt that it was prevalent in their organizations. And we know that during the pandemic and the great res resignation, the number one reason people gave for leaving was burnout, but number two was too much organizational change. So change on itself, you can overwhelm your people. There's six symptoms of change fatigue. So the first is disengagement. People become apathetic and emotionally check out. The second is exhaustion, just lack of energy, staring into space, sleeping at work. Absenteeism, so people start leaving work early or taking sick days to kind of take care of themselves. Confusion, which leads to poor judgment and decision making. And then conflict, actually tension and conflict between individuals and teams goes up. And you also start to see more cynicism, which is increased complaints, skepticism and resistance. Typically, you know, we can handle change fatigue if we're given a chance to kind of recover and not hit with more change, we'll bounce back. So if you keep pushing change at people, you can push them into burnout. So let me talk about burnout. Burnout is, is like change fatigue 10x. It's just a whole nother level. And before the pandemic, the World Health Organization had identified it as one of the biggest global work, workplace challenges. 
And we know that burnout got worse through the pandemic because the pandemic was a huge amount of change that was also put on everyone. So burnout has three components. It's, it's a medically diagnosable state of exhaustion, and there's three parts. So the first is emotional exhaustion, what you'd think. It's the fatigue that comes from caring too much for too long. And the symptoms are chronic fatigue, but cruelly insomnia. You are exhausted, but you just can't sleep. That leads to impaired concentration or forgetfulness. People are quicker to anger. They're more likely to get sick. Anxiety and depression goes up. And some people have physical symptoms like heart palpitations, chest pain, stomach pain, dizziness, headaches, that kind of thing. The second component is called lack of accomplishment. And that's the unconquerable sense of futility, feeling that nothing you do makes any difference. So the symbol I use for this is kind of you're like you're running on that gerbil wheel and you're going round and round and you're not getting anywhere. And this leads to feelings of apathy and hopelessness. People get more irritable, they get less productive, and that leads to a lower performance. This is the one that I think drove the great resignation is that people were really burned out, but how it was showing up in their lives is like, huh, I used to like this job and I just, I don't feel it anymore. Or I used to like this team, but I just feel meh all the time. And so people thought, oh, I guess I should go get a new job when really what they needed to do was focus on their burnout. And then the third component, and we all saw this play out. Remember at the pandemic, you know, at 7 p.m., we'd all go out and applaud the healthcare workers. And then at some point we stopped and then eventually they became targets. It's depletion of empathy. So we become more detached and we depersonalize because we just have no more caring or compassion to give. What's really sad about this component is there's loss of enjoyment. And so you're losing enjoyment in anything that used to make you happy. It's just all kind of leaching away. And that leads people to become more isolated, disconnected, detached. And sadly, this is not only for other people, but it's even for themselves. So what's problematic about burnout is by the time you realize you're in trouble, you don't have the energy to get yourself back out of it. It almost always needs outside intervention. And medical professionals call burnout the erosion of the soul because it slowly just takes away the things that gave you joy. So unfortunately, I would say because of change fatigue and and the burnout from the pandemic, because everyone overworked to compensate for the stress they were feeling, people are still burned out today. And it, we're four years out, you know? And so burnout's still very much an issue and it gets in the way of people really being able to bring their best selves to work. It's also what's behind the minute any office tries to bring workers back into the workplace, why they resist so strongly. It's all, it's all because people have not yet healed from the burnout. It definitely hasn't gone away, and there's a biological com component of it. So let's talk about the brain on change, because you identify four structures in the brain that are really affected by change. The first one is the amygdala, and that's you know connecting, and that is connected to all your sensory nerves. It's designed to detect threats in our environment. I've heard the term amygdala hijack a lot, where you just get so overwhelmed by something that it just kind of takes control of your brain. You're not thinking rationally, and you look at the worst case scenario for things. So perhaps go into that a little bit more about the role the amygdala plays in, in uh, change, and then we'll talk about the other structures as well. Sounds great. Well, so you're exactly right. The amygdala is the part of our brain that's kind of responsible for kicking off the fight, flight, freeze response. And if you've ever been in a near car accident or anything like that, you have felt how quickly that adrenaline can come on. It's 200 milliseconds and it's firing all this stuff off in your body. And how the amygdala works is, you know, the optical nerve touches it, the auditory nerve touches it. So its job is basically scanning your environment right now. Right now, as you're listening to this, your, in, your amygdala is scanning your environment. And as long as nothing changes, it's like, we're good. It's fine. Everything's good. We're fine. But if you were to hear a loud noise, like an explosion, or you smelled fire smoke, that reaction would kick off. So what's really interesting is to the amygdala, change, any kind of change in your environment is potential danger until it gets more information. So once it gets more information, it can say, oh, that's just across the street. I can simmer down now. But it goes on alert because we are all the descendants of people who had highly attuned amygdalas and realized that the grass looked different today than it did yesterday. And there's now a big lion in there waiting to get us. 
So we are, uh, we are attuned. And once I learned this about the amygdala, it was like, oh, no wonder. Like the minute we even say the word change in organizations, people go, "Uh uh-oh, you know, they immediately flinch because they're worried that something bad might happen. And then of course, if you've had a couple failed changes where bad stuff did happen, then it's even kind of reinforced. We also have this internal GPS system that's vital to every species. It allows us to build new mental maps. And this process, however, takes some time and energy for individuals to navigate new spaces that may become with a change. So, you know, that's part of the reason, right, where we kind of feel this mental and physical fatigue when we start something new or go through a big change. Yeah. So the interrhinal cortex is it, it's our inner GPS. So um, the researchers who discovered it found that within the structure of the brain, there's literally a sphere of cells. It's a physical sphere of cells. And they would hook up rats and put them in a maze. And as they were walking that maze, they could see those cells literally light up in this sphere to make a map. And if they popped the rat into a new maze, he made a new map. And if they brought him back to the old one, he'd literally bring up the map. We all have these maps. It's how you can get to the grocery store and your dentist and get back home and not necessarily need to look it up on your phone. So this part of the brain is really powerful, but like I felt this when, when LinkedIn bought lynda.com, I was reassigned from Santa Barbara to Silicon Valley, Mountain View. So all of a sudden I was flying up there every week and I didn't know where anything was. I didn't know where the IT people were. I didn't know where to get food. I didn't know where my teammates sat. And so those first probably five or six weeks, I was exhausted every day by about 2 p.m. And part of it was the interrhinal cortex. I was having to form all new maps. And on top of it, because I wasn't going home, I was going to a hotel. I couldn't even, I I tried to work it. So I went back to the same hotel, but it was crazy up there. So I ended up at a new hotel almost every week. I just felt the exhaustion of not being able to lean on my maps. Um, And they're both physical space like that, as well as social space. So we also use this part of the brain makes maps of our social networks and my entire work social network changed. I had a different boss. I had a different team. I was in a different department. It all shifted. So I had a real lived experience. Now my brain built new maps. That's its job, but it took a lot of energy and it really contributes to the exhaustion you feel in the middle of a change or a big move, um, something like that. Now, the next structure every learning professional should be familiar with, the basal ganglia, it's responsible for taking actions we do frequently, turning them into habits, and change requires people to focus and concentrate until they learn the new cues, the new routines. So it takes a lot of time and energy and can definitely lead to change fatigue. Absolutely. And I think this is where we fall down a lot, is that the research shows that it takes about 40 to 50, on average, repetitions of a behavior for the basal ganglia to kick in and make it into a habit. And yet we launch change without a lot of support. Oftentimes we're asking people to not only develop a new habit that's awkward and uncomfortable to do, but they probably had a well-grooved habit already in place. And so if we don't have enough training time or practice time and help people get on that pathway to 40 to 50 repetitions, they're just going to go back to the field or their office and do it the old way because it's the fastest, easiest thing for them to do. So this is honestly why a lot of change fails, is that we don't support people in changing the habit that's going to make them successful. Um, But yeah, it's 40 to 50 repetitions is what it usually takes. And now now I think of myself as a habit designer. And even when I'm going through a change, um, like when I want to learn something new, I will literally try to do it 20 times so I can get on the path. and, And I keep track of where I am in my 50. Another critical element that you mentioned as well that we found through all of all the uh, programs that we do is really creating compelling rewards that they can have in the moment. Because usually when you have a habit or a good habit that you want to build, the rewards are in the future, right? The the other piece of it really is in the present, right? It's, you know, it's, it's the stuff that's kind of tempting you not to really neurally groove that habit because there are so many temptations now that are rewarding you for not doing it. So it's Having that compelling reward in doing so also helps in in hopefully forming those habits over time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the research shows that they took groups of people, for example, here's a couple of the studies they did, you know, people who wanted to exercise more, 
and they broke them into two groups and they had the exact same routine, get up at a certain time, go for a run or go work out. But one group gave themselves a small square of chocolate when they were done and the other group didn't. And what they found is just adding that little bit of reward, the group that did that, the habit got established much faster. You don't reward forever. So at some point you stop having the chocolate. Um, but they sustained that habit for many more months than the other group did. And so it's really interesting. I actually am now, I, I joined this thing. It's called the Conqueror Challenge and it's an app, but I'm trying to walk more. But if I just go walk more, it's like, okay, I've got my walk in, whatever. But on this Conqueror Challenge, you actually are buying um, a location. So I just hiked Mount Fuji, but I'm doing it on my phone. So every day I'm logging in how many miles I walked and I can see on the map where I am on the trail. I can go into street view and actually see pictures of Japan. And at the end, they send you a medal, like a really nice medal. And it has really changed my whole commitment to exercise. I find myself now, if I'm waiting somewhere 15 minutes, I start walking back and forth just so I can get my, my miles in. Um, the brain really loves rewards. And I think that we really ignore that as a key element in helping people develop the right habits and get them, get them going on the path we want them to be on. And gamification is so essential. I've had BJ Fogg on the podcast previously, and you know he advocates for that celebratory moment of shine that you just, hopefully that will lock in that new habit fairly quickly. If you just celebrate it, it could be a personal celebration, it could be a public one, but it's important to celebrate those small milestones on your way to that larger goal. Absolutely. The final piece really um, that you mentioned in the book is this structure that's really responsible in the brain for decision-making and actions by creating these chemical guardrails that moderate our behavior. Uh, they release the dopamine and the serotonin for the feel-good chemicals, but they also restrict you from undergoing behaviors that are painful over time. Yeah, this is the one that really blew my mind is the research about the habenula. So the habenula's job is to prevent us from making future mistakes. So the way I found the best way to describe it is think back to our kind of our tribal days. If I went down a pathway and I found food or water, your brain will give you feel good chemicals, serotonin, dopamine, serotonin, dopamine. And let's say the next day I go down a different path and there's no, there's nothing there that's going to help my survival. The habenula becomes active. And when it's active, it's restricting, it's cutting off the serotonin dopamine, essentially making me get no reward for that other path. So the next week, when I come to this fork in the road, I'm just going to subtly psychologically feel like I want to go down the first path and I'm not going to be so motivated to go down the second path. What's really crazy about the habenula is it can go, it can be so strong as to suppress your motor neurons, making it hard to walk down the wrong pathway. And as the more I researched this, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners have people in their, in, the, in their lives who suffer from depression. And it turns out the habenula is overactive in people with depression, essentially taking away the experience of serotonin and dopamine in their lives. And this motor suppression, a lot of people with depression talk about how I, I'm struggling to get out of bed. That's not just a phrase. They literally are having a hard time getting their muscles to move to get out of bed. And so the benula is really powerful. How this plays out with workplace change is that, and this is where if I'm standing with a huge audience, I'll say, okay, everyone raise your hands if you launched a change initiative last year. All the hands go up. Leave them up if they were on budget half the hands come down. Leave them up if it was on time, the rest of the hands come down. And so here's what staff meetings look like. If, if you were on my team, you know, what typical managers do is come in and be like, okay, you guys, we're, we're over budget, we're behind schedule, we gotta, we gotta hustle, we gotta hustle. And the brain is hearing failure, failure, failure. When really what the manager needs to come in and do is say, all right, you guys, we accomplished ABC, high fives all around, good job all right, we are over budget and behind schedule. We got to hustle. What are we going to do to move faster? But we skip the reward altogether. And so over time, this is how people become more change resistant is, you know, we don't reward change. And, and even when we hit the, we cross the finish line, let alone milestones, it's usually forgotten and ignored. So it's the one thing I really work with executives on is, and, and making sure middle managers know is that you have to really, reward effort and progress and not just finishing the finish line, but especially when you hit the finish line, acknowledge it because people just did some big stuff. 
I hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights. If it has, I ask you to share it with someone who would also benefit from it. If you've been enjoying and gaining knowledge from this podcast, then subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the previous episodes of the podcast and additional learning resources. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple or Spotify and leave up to a five-star review.